All right, welcome to Gothcast. I am Dr. Sanders. And this is Robbie Gore. And today, well, what's tomorrow? Well, tomorrow is going to be Halloween. Halloween, that's right. And we thought in honor of Halloween, the the greatest goth holiday, or the main goth holiday, I guess. The Christmas of goth Christmas days. of goth. <laughs> it's like the nightmare before Christmas. Yeah. Wait, oh. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, today we're going to be talking about three horror movies, and they're considered classics in their own way. In fact, one's considered one of the greatest horror films of all time. Yep. Um, and we're going to be talking about George Romero's Dead series. Yeah. So, so that would be Night of the Living Dead. Dawn of the Dead. And Day of the Dead. That's right. So we're going to talk about those three films and some of their impact. I mean, pretty much if it wasn't for Night of the Living Dead, you know. Kind of started what are zombie films. Well, at least, yeah. It definitely popularized it. And uh, yeah, there's all these sort of milestones with that film. But we thought that this would be great because, you know, while people do like zombie films, especially, you know, now it's kind of overblown yeah, to the point of like ridiculous, you know, we have like the big blockbuster zombie films like World War Z and... And we have Walking Dead, which yeah. is one of the most successful, you know, AMC series to come out to date. Yeah. And so you have all uh, mainstream love zombies, right? Yep. And so people got burnt out on zombies. And I thought this would be good to kind of remind people that, yeah, they, these were good before <laughs> yeah before the burnout and the you know zombie movies aren't uh always what you think of them yeah that's very true um so getting right into it let's start with 1968 classic night of the living dead yeah so this film really is a classic there's a few things about it that you know are noteworthy for one it was released on a very small budget as it was an independent film mm-hmm it was completed on a budget of one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. Yeah, and that was, was incredibly small. For and that the time. was them raising it pretty much independently. I think there was something like when they started out, they were like ten people or something like that, and they yep. each like pitched in six hundred dollars, and then they found like funding for it through showing people like clips of it. And yeah, yeah. So basically, the whole part of it was trying to get people from Pittsburgh to donate money to make yeah. it. And it's also become a massive success over the years but it wasn't always a classic in fact it was initially heavily criticized for being too graphic and too gory many people you know or many film critics felt that that uh it was really just too raunchy to be accepted yeah this was um this was in a time right before i think the ratings board was adjusted or basically came into effect it was it was basically released the month before i think it was like the MPA officially started or something. So yeah. it just like barely made it with unrated. Yep. Um, yeah. So if you find this movie now, it'll always say, you know, NR, not rated. Yeah. Because it was like, it was like a month before. It was like, like November's when it started and it was released like October 1st, yeah. 1968. Uh, so it just barely scraped by. And then the other thing, and I don't know how many people are aware of this, but you know, you can go watch, you can go watch now. The Living Dead right now, yep. right? Even if you don't... For you know, free. Yeah, for free. It's because it is public domain. Mm-hmm. And and it's pretty much carried on like every kind of you know movie or TV show network. Yep. Like Amazon has it for free. You can find it on YouTube. Yep. You know. Yeah. So you can go, you can find it right now. And the reason that is, it, you know, because you may be asking yourself like, oh, or, you know, some... Movies from the 30s aren't in public domain. You know, like yeah. you know, like The Wizard of Oz isn't in public domain. And this is a 1968 film. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and when I say Wizard of Oz isn't in public domain, I mean the 1930s film. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, that's the whole thing. Um, but Night of Living Dead, when they made it, there was a title card. Like basically, you have to. There's a stipulation. Yeah, that you have to say that it's copyrighted or who owns it or whatever. And if you're watching Night of the Living Dead, you can tell, you know, from the credits and stuff, there's not, you know, it's people who directed in, you know, like all the writers and stuff, but there's nobody saying, you know, this is a George Romero production or, you know, like whatever. Yeah. There's no copyright on it. And that's because apparently when they were editing it, it was, you know, like flesh eating, flesh eaters or something, you know, zombie flesh eaters or something. Yeah. Had an, had an original title. And there was a copyright underneath that initially. But when they changed the title and they redid it, they didn't put a copyright underneath it. Yeah. And I guess they didn't really even think about it, mm-hmm. you know, of what 
the repercussions that, that might be. Yeah, the implications. Yeah, and so within a few years, I think almost immediately, it went into public domain. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, it became huge. It became even bigger than it probably would have ever been. Yeah, and although it did become huge, initially Romero was very upset about it going mm-hmm. into public domain. Yeah. You know, you know, you can just imagine from a filmmaker's perspective, you know, not knowing, you know, what the future was going to hold to have, you know, raised all this money yourself to produce a movie and then have it just be released for anyone to watch whenever they want without paying anything. Yeah. And it wasn't as big of a deal as it was, you know, like um, in the 60s and 70s, because, you know, you have to have film print, you yeah. know, you have to like... But it was still, you know, like discouraging because then it's like, oh, well, you know, if, if somebody can get a, the rights, anybody can show it, you yep. know, theater, anybody, any theater can show it and just pocket all the money, mm-hmm. um, anything like that. And so, you know, it was very, it's good, an accident, yeah. right? It's not, yeah. It made it so that anyone could easily get their hands on, yeah. you know, the movie itself. Basically, if we wanted to do a Gothcast DVD of Night of the Living Dead, we could do it. We could release it, yeah. Yeah. Like, th- that's just how it is. And, I think um, I, there's like some rumor that George Romero, when especially when it started becoming really popular on VHS, yeah, because there were so many VHS copies of so many VHS and DVD copies, yeah, because of it, yeah, you only could print it, yeah. As you can even look on Amazon, like there's so so many different versions of mm-hmm. it, like that. You know, he was kind of bummed out because he didn't get any of that money for that. Yeah, I mean, it was just that, that's it. I mean, people could just release it. He would see his movie at every movie store in America. But he didn't earn any profit from it. But ultimately, that ended up being a good thing because it made the movie massively popular because it pushed it into circulation. Mm -hmm. And it brought George Romero a level of fame that he might not have received otherwise. And then, you know, he managed to continue his career off of that everybody had seen it. Yep. Um, So let's just kind of get into the plot of Night of the Living Dead. So right at the beginning. Takes place in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. So it takes place in Pennsylvania. And you have Barbara and Johnny. Barbara and Johnny. They're yep. they're going to um, leave flowers for his father. Yep. Or their father, like brother and sister, right? And so they're um, going to leave flowers for the father. And then, yeah, you know, it's their Johnny's, annual visit. Yeah, Johnny's complaining that like, oh, you know, why can't mom be down here? And like, we just have to do this for her and mm-hmm. all stuff. And they're attacked by. A man, a man who's kind of stumbling around the... He's acting very strange. Yeah. And, you know, Johnny's initially kind of making fun of the whole thing. and Yeah. It's uh, like, they're coming to get you, Barbara. Yep. Just in case you're wondering where that line was from. That line's been using like everything, but that's where that, that line is from. So they're attacked and basically Johnny is killed. Yeah. The, in a know, very 60s the way. The person his head. throws him against a gravestone and you know, knocks him out. Yeah. And so Barbara runs yeah escapes on foot <laughs> and by the way her, her name is barbara not barbara yeah barbara not not three syllable barbara yeah two syllable it's b-a-r no b-a-r-b-r-a yeah like yeah. barbara but yeah exactly i always thought that was so funny <laughs> like um but yeah she runs and you know takes the car and tries to get away and all but this nothing works with the car so yeah. she has to walk or she yeah. runs and so she finds this house and uh there's Another man there. He's well, you know, she's walking around the house and everything, and she doesn't really understand what's happening. You know why the man is chasing her or anything. Yep. And so this man named Ben shows up. Yep. And he he's also fleeing similar yeah creatures. And so he gets in and he, he barricades the door. Um, he had, he like stole this truck from you know managed to find this truck because he's like these things are everywhere you know. Yep. And he calls them monsters. They don't call them zombies in this yeah. film, by the way. I'll- well, and th- that's kind of an important thing to note about this film is that it's kind of sets up what is the modern zombie. Yeah. Yet they never referred to anyone as a zombie in this mm-hmm. movie. Um, you know, it's Night of the Living Dead, mm-hmm. and you know, people are kind of depicted as these creepy, ghoulish creatures, which are you know similar to what the modern zombie is, yeah. but uh, not quite exactly the same thing exactly um but this would ultimately lead to the evolution that would bring us the modern zombie exactly so after ben you know kind of barricades the house a little bit you find out there's a few more people in the house so you have harry and Mm -hmm. helen cooper and then there's their daughter karen um you also have this young couple tom and judy yep who are like the 
typical teenage couple. Yeah, who look, a, who look a little bit older than teenagers, if I do say so myself. <laughs> yeah, um, well, it was a little more common back then for uh, yeah. older actors to play younger. People. Yeah, exactly. Um, but so uh, there's this. Basically, that's most. That's basically the whole plot. I mean, is that they're inside this this house. It's essentially, you know, they're trapped in there and. It really where a lot of the plot is though is in the conversation and the the text and the dialogue of this mm-hmm. film. Yeah. Um, and seeing the way that the characters handle the situation and you know how things kind of just start to dissipate. For one, you know, Barbara starts to kind of lose it a little bit. She's like catatonic. Yeah. Like and I will say like she is very frustrating in this film. Yeah. <laughs> like uh it's I know George Romero like later was like yeah, when he did Day of the Dead, he was kind of like, I got to kind of apologize for the how badly written and like how my bad my women characters were before. Yep. And Barbara is the perfect example. Like, especially Ben is trying so hard to. You know, Ben's the most sane character yeah, in this definitely. You know, situation. And, uh, you know, not to say that, you know, the other characters aren't acting sanely, but it's an intensely stressful situation. And most people would kind of lose it if they were being chased by the living dead. Yeah. But Ben is able to kind of keep himself together and try to, you know, create some plans, try to, you know, establish some rules of safety for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, But everybody's fighting him on everything. No one agrees. You know, uh, they're having massive problems with uh, trying to decide on what to do. Yep. Karen ends up getting bitten by one of the uh, the creatures, as they call them. Yeah. They just call them zombies. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we know what they are. Yep. And so she's fallen ill as she's, you know, turning, basically. Mm-hmm. And that's the that's uh, Harry's daughter. Yeah. So that's like the youngest person in the house. Yep. Um, but yeah, there's like, it's just this whole dynamic of, it, while, it, while it sounds really simple, especially for today, you know, like people basically barricading themselves in the house from a zombie invasion. Yeah. That's pretty much what the first, what's considered like the first zombie film was all about. Yep. And, um, well, and a lot of this movie is about subtlety. So like you have radio broadcasts and television and mm-hmm. things that are informing them about what's going on around them so that they know, you know, other people are being attacked and there's multiple of these creatures, you know, there's it's kind of an epidemic. Mm hmm. And you, you watch these characters break down as they realize, you know, the, their safety has been taken from them. You know, they've lived in a world in which they feel that they're protected by the government. But when something arises that the government can't handle, they're left themselves to deal with it. Yeah. And when they themselves are left to deal with it, they don't know what to do. They start fighting. You know, they're violent towards each other. Yeah. In many ways, they, you know, they're reflections of the zombies themselves. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. It's um, it, it's just very appropriate that even in the first zombie film, the the people who you're like, you root for people to die. It's like, yeah. you know, it's already those that stereotype of like, I hate that guy. Like, I want that guy to die. Like, you know, yep. it's, it's so funny because you have... Ben Ben is obviously the most likable character in this film. Yeah. And Harry is obviously a giant douche. Harry's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just he's just awful. He just won't listen to anything that Ben says. Or anybody. Yeah. You know, he won't even listen to his family. And so he's and he's he's like the the first person like a horror movie that just like turns on everybody and it's yep. like like the guy who grabs the, like the first guy who grabs the gun in a horror movie and points it at the people yep. while they're escaping from zombies. It's just like Totally ridiculous. Yeah, I just I think that that's that the strongest thing about this movie is the you know is the characters. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a really supremely well written film because, like you said, most of it is dialogue. You know, it's mm-hmm. just it's there's not a ton of music happening, and the music that is there is pretty much yeah they bought. You know, like they didn't make yeah. they didn't make me they bought it from like old movies. And we do see you know the zombies or creatures, whatever you want to call them, but they aren't the majority of the film. The, the majority of the film is spent within, you know, the house, within Deciding the cellar. Deciding what to do. Yeah. And so it's really more of a story about what people do in a, you know, a situation of panic, you know. And so I, this obviously inspired many movies that were to come. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. We're trapped in this facility. We're trapped in this cabin. We're trapped in this house. We're trapped in, I mean, 
just you name it but space but i will say a lot of movies do follow this plot but not as many of them do it as subtly or as you know nuanced but one movie that does come to mind is 13 cloverfield lane Ah. it kind of reminds me of this in the way that yeah you know it mostly revolves around the dialogue and you don't really spend time you know looking at the creatures and that's why people were mad because it was called cloverfield (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's a i I totally agree with that though yeah um but but this is just like it's it is really subtle it's you know if you're if you've never seen not living dead and i get it like people don't like going back and watching black and white films yeah you have to be prepared for you know a slower paced yeah. film and this isn't really that short of a film no it's not it's, it, i think it's close to two hours i think so i think yeah. in the in the cuts that a lot of the cuts you can find yeah out there like i said because of public domain people have cut it up a lot yeah like um it, this is some versions that are way shorter some versions that are a little bit longer i think the digitally remastered ones like about two hours something like that yeah and it feels pretty long yeah <laughs> but actually i think one of the things that's funny about this movie is they actually try to have an explanation for the zombies but george romero has gone on record saying that they don't actually know what they're talking about like yeah it's like this whole subplot of like oh is it radiation and all stuff he's like they don't know like he's like he's like nobody really knows yeah and uh well i i could see him wanting to write it as you know them trying to explain it but not really knowing but it would have been nice if that was you know, developed a bit more yeah because i could definitely see or the government being like oh yeah this is a radiation outbreak because they don't want people to you know freak out at the thought that there might be something supernatural going on mm-hmm. or something that can't be explained by science yeah i want to say something about the uh the zombies even though that all these all the creatures in here are just you know basic zombies yep i do want to say i miss the time when there was memorable zombies yeah like i i'd like the fact that pretty much all the zombies in this and yeah it's because they had so few extras Mm -hmm. so they had like you know they have like the main zombie guy yeah i really like that in fact inside of all these movies we're gonna see that there's like a a kind of main or unique zombie that has kind of become memorable yeah uh and i like that that the the zombie in this has become memorable and he you know he's a good actor Yep. For the undead, I guess. And I really like the makeup <laughs> for the zombies because it does kind of leave it in this weird place where, you know, obviously they're alluding at the idea that they're zombies, but it's not specific. And the makeup isn't specific either. Mm-hmm. You know, they're ghoulish looking, but we don't know are they zombies? Are they diseased? Yeah. You know, are they demons? Like, what, what are they? Yeah, pretty much the, the only difference between these zombies and the humans is that they have makeup that makes their facial features more defined. Yeah. It, like it makes them look a little more gaunt, but that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think one of the, you know, most interesting things about this film is uh, we later see that Barbara's brother is, you know, among the zombies. Yeah. Uh, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it adds that, er- oh, it adds the element of terror to it that, uh, you know, it's not just that they're killing you, they're, they're turning you into them. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh my gosh uh yeah i i totally agree that that's you know the scary one of the scarier things about this movie yep you know especially for the time it's like oh my gosh but yeah i I think it does not have a happy ending though for those of you who are looking for that yeah okay spoilers on a 1968 public domain film <laughs> uh at the end pretty much everyone dies well everyone dies everyone does everyone die. dies in the film and it's a really sad sad ending because ben well, makes it all yeah, the way Ben makes it to the end everyone else dies and ben survives yeah and he's mistakenly shot by basically these rangers basically all these people trying to go clean up the zombie problem yeah they think he's one of the zombies yeah, and they just shoot him from a distance yep. in the house and that's it that's the end of the film and it sucks like, yeah but it it's almost kind of a beautiful ending because it's so realistic and representative of what would actually happen. Yeah. You, you would have you someone... tell me that wouldn't happen today? <laughs> that would completely happen today. You do, if people are, you know, freaking out and there's some kind of epidemic and you think that you're in danger and you see someone who could potentially be a threat, people shoot first and ask questions yep, later. That's absolutely true. And I know, uh, I guess I'll talk about this. And like, I know this was a huge issue at the time because Ben... Uh, is played by an African American actor, mm-hmm. and people thought that it was, you know, obviously a comment on a critique, yeah, on racism and all this stuff. And Martin, when the movie was released, uh, I think George Romero said like right when they were 
going to, you know, like they just finished editing it. Yeah. And they were in the car with the print. They then they got news that Martin Luther King had been shot. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're like, oh, man, this is going to become, you know, this may be something. And uh, a lot of people tried to put the commentary, like say that, like, you know, that this is a critique, you know, having a black man shot by rednecks at the end and yeah. all stuff. And George Romero and everyone involved with the film, all the actors, everyone has said, that's not true. They said, we just cast him because he was the best actor. Yeah. And it, he is. He's, he's amazing in this film. <laughs> he's really, really good. Yeah. It, it wasn't their intention to create a social critique of, you know, African Americans and, you know, society and their persecution. Yeah. However, nonetheless... uh it was certainly received that way and it, it definitely was and, people, and it remains uh relevant if you look at it in that regard yeah and people still comment on how it was like the first i think it's one of the first films to have a, a black male lead yep and you know that's that, i mean that's great but it's it's so funny because of where they came from they were just like they yeah. didn't even think about it and especially but because of the fact that the film broke into basically the mainstream and has been around for so yeah. long that's when it became a problem, you know, to nobody making the film was this an issue Yeah. when they were editing it. They didn't think about that, mm -hmm. but then it became this huge issue. Yeah. And that's very indicative of very similar situations with many different, you know, filmmakers and writers. You put out pieces of work and then people, you know, obviously spend time doing, you know, analysis of the film or, you know, book or whatever is mm -hmm. released. And they come up with their own theories about, you know, what is trying to be represented or, you know, shown by this mm -hmm. piece of art. And, you know, authors often don't think about, you know, social implications yeah. when they're writing. Sometimes they just sit down and write. And you know, sometimes you get a piece that, you know, brings to light social issues, but it's not necessarily intentional. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and there was definitely a lot of tension at that time in America. Yeah, it was, it was, it was just crazy. Yeah. So um, uh, one of the other things I want to talk about is – a lot of people call this the first zombie film, right? Yep. Well, inside of 1964, Vincent Price was in a movie called The Last Man on Earth, right? Yep. And uh, Night Living Dead, is he was inspired by the, the book I Am Legend. Yep. Right? And you guys have seen the Will Smith movie probably. Yeah, but, which is... Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, but then uh, oh. Vincent Price is starred in The Last Man on Earth, which is an adaptation of I Am Legend, right? Yep. And there's people who stumble around at night going, rah, but they talk. They yep. go like, you know, they call the guy's name, but they're called vampires. In well, it. in I'm Legend, the book itself, they were originally vampires. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but if you see Last Man on Earth, it's like the exact same thing, yep. but four years <laughs> earlier. It's like a man barricaded in his house, like trying to find hell. It's like, I don't know. It's it's such a good movie, by the way. We're probably going to talk about that eventually. Yeah. But um. I thought I'd mention that, that he was partially inspired by that story. Um, but yeah, if you want to get Night of Living Dead, there's a lot of different versions of it. So I really recommend doing your research on yeah. which versions. If you want to see it in color, now there is a version I recommend for color. Um, yeah. I know people are like, ooh, I can't, you know, like I only have to watch in black. That's the only way to watch Night of Living Dead is black and white. Yeah. Some people just can't stand black and white. It's It's really sad. I, I know. Um, I, I do like both versions of the film. I think I personally like the black and white version a little bit more. Uh, you know, well, I really like the black and white version because I, I basically watched the black and white version yeah. all the way up until I basically watched it for this episode. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had never seen it in color because I was like, blah, 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 you know, like. I just, my only really contention with the colorized version mm -hmm. is that I don't feel that the zombies or creatures look as menacing in color i would agree with that they definitely try to colorize them a little bit more like you know how the dawn and day yeah. the day did them you know more a little more colorful yeah so they're not as menacing but i gotta say that i always had seen colorizing of films really stupid yeah but i saw the colorization of the 2004 colorized version of it mm -hmm. i was so impressed by it oh it's it's incredibly it's, well done how do, oh man it's like it's so crazy how they can do that and it, it looks so much more modern yeah but uh yeah like i said i hadn't i was totally like bleh against it but hey if you're if you want to see it in color and you want to see what it would have looked like i mean i think it's about as close as you can get to if it was actually shot in color yeah. i mean it is crazy uh but like i said there's like three different versions of it colorized yeah 
So the 2004 version is the one that you'd want to see. Definitely. Um, and then if you want to stick to the classic black and white, you have an infinite number of options. <laughs> but for those of you who have Amazon Prime memberships, I know a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. It's probably like the most popular way to get anything delivered these days. Yeah. Amazon Prime Video currently has this up on their, you know, Prime Video catalog. Mm-hmm. So you can watch it for free and it's the digitally remastered version. Yeah. And so it, it's it's about as good a quality you're going to get for that you know yeah. version of the film um so it's a great way to watch it that's free if you have prime and you know i know a lot of people do so i thought i'd mention that uh, yeah. otherwise you know if there's dvds of it there's blu-rays of it it's online for free yeah. you like know. i said just with any of them if you're going to actually invest money into it yeah you know like a physical copy just do a little bit of research because like i said anyone can release this so yeah. there's tons and tons of dvds and blu-rays and stuff that have no special features that yeah. are really bad picture quality because yeah, don't can, spend money on a Blu-ray that doesn't have some kind of George Romero commentary. Yeah, or something. I think there's one. <laughs> there's a few like Tom Savini yeah. and Mr. Science Three Thousand did a really good one, but but just do your research, okay? Yep. Um, so yeah, that's Night of the Living Dead. Yep. All right, now welcome to Recent Interesting Goth Stuff. A.K.A. Riggs. Yeah, and today we uh, have, I don't know, two weird stories. At least I think that they're weird, but they always are weird. So Yeah. Um, one of the things is that Rob Zombie keeps having to <laughs> basically clarify with people who, I guess there was some sort of crowdfunding for his movie 31. Yeah. And so... He's not having to post because people keep saying like, oh, well, the movie's out and I haven't gotten my Blu-ray or my DVD yet. Yeah. And I guess it's supposed to be like signed or something. And he's said a whole bunch of times like, no, the movie will be released. And then then like later it'll be a thing. But he posted it again. And I guess people keep just getting really mad at him. Um, But here's his response to all that going on right now. It's, it just keeps continuing. The more reviews and stuff for 31 come out, everybody yeah. keeps complaining more and more to him. He goes... For everyone complaining about not getting their DVD slash Blu-ray yet, they do not exist. We are in the process of finishing these up. I know it seems like a long wait, but that's because you order a DVD of a movie because you order a DVD of a movie that wasn't even was not even filmed yet when you ordered it. This was a crowdfund thing, so things move slower, and then just buying a DVD off of Amazon. So everyone's saying they got ripped. You were ripped. Well, you were not. Uh, you'll get what you order, but the Blu-ray slash DVD is the last thing to be shipped. I hope this answers your questions. The only th- items left are signed scripts, which are just back from the print and shipping this week. Everything else has been sent. So I know he's been like having to clarify that a lot. Yep. Uh, and it's, of course, just like every horror movie, his thing's been getting um, mixed reviews. Yeah. Like, and a lot of people say it's... Yeah. Oh, it's gory and fun and stuff. And other people are saying, oh, it's dry and Rob Zombie's worst film and blah, blah, blah. Rob Zombie always kind of sits in the middle of the road for horror films, at least with the critics. Mm. Uh, you know, people either, he's a love him or hate him kind of guy. Like, you either really love his work or you hate it. Because Rob Zombie definitely has a, a signature style when it comes to directing, producing, writing. And his films... I don't know what to say about them besides that they're very Rob Zombie. Uh, it's usually pretty gruesome, pretty colorful. Mm-hmm. And 31 does not disappoint in that regard. Yeah. However, people will often critique them for not being, you know, really the same things that they critique all horror films for, for not being as deep as they could be and things like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think, I think the movies are okay for what they are. Oh, yeah, by the way, he was also talking about the House of a Thousand Corpses. Eric, like, Everybody was t- like, wants him to do like an extended cut because he always talks about how much was cut out of that film. Like, yeah, all the all these scenes they were cut and this was cut. And he's like, no, all that footage is lost, so it's never happening. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but that's funny. He's just like, nope, it's not happening. I know that John Carpenter has criticized him before because he did the Halloween remakes. Yeah, and he was like, oh, oh I could imagine John so Carpenter awful. would be pissed off. John Carpenter just gets mad about everything, though. I know, <laughs> but John Carpenter's so good. <laughs> He is, but he's directed some really bad movies. I know. Uh, was that one Ghost of, Ghost of Mars or something? But the, they're bad in a magical way. Not the new, <laughs> no, some of them are not. <laughs> yes, there are some that are are bad in a magical way. They Live is a perfect example. That movie's like really freaking weird, but it's it's such a such a good movie. 
that's like a five minute like uncut fight scene. <laughs> so weird. But yeah, I know he criticized him like using the music all the time and mm-hmm. and then uh giving him backstory. Yeah. Like more backstory. He was like, gosh, so that was so unnecessary. He should be like a uh he should be a magical creature that just kills everybody and stuff and but it's like you know let him make the adaptation he wants to make. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's Rob Zombie. Yeah. Uh, in other news, kind of pertaining to you know, the episode we did today. Mm-hmm. Uh kind of stumbled across something I didn't expect to see on the internet. Yeah. I really want it, although I don't know if I'm willing to spend the money on it. Huh? But on Fangoria right now, you can get a George Romero plushie. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? Um, we have just reviewed three George Romero films. I don't remember that. <laughs> when did that happen? Uh, I would say something about five, ten minutes ago. I do not recall. Mm. But okay, I'll take your word for it. All right, all right. But yeah, it's uh, it's pretty hilarious and awesome. It's you got George Romero, you know, looking like he normally does, his vest and his glasses, but he's all kind of like spattered with blood. Looks like he just walked off the set of a horror film. George uh, Romero could probably kill somebody and get away with it because it would just be like, oh, he's like, yeah, it's for a movie, <laughs> and the cops pull him over. You're George uh, Romero. For anyone who's interested in buying it, it is sixty dollars, so it's a pretty steep price. Jeez. But I don't know when you're ever going to see a George Romero plushie again. Come on, people. One do with it. that much detail. Do it, people. So, uh, I don't know. I might consider getting it. Oh, um, that's interesting. For, for them, yeah. For those of you who are fans of George Romero, might be some worth checking out. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's uh, some recent guest stuff. Everybody's mad at Rob Zombie, and everybody loves George Romero. Yep. Kind of. Hi. Okay, it's so now we're a decade later. Yeah, literally 10 years later. And this is <laughs> Dawn of the Dead. Yeah. And George Romero had been doing some other, you know, films, but maybe we'll talk about this some other time. Yeah. Uh, but this is what is considered the uh, official sequel to this, or to Night of the Living Dead mm-hmm. in the, you know, Living Dead series by Romero. Yeah. Of course, filmed in Pittsburgh again, takes place in Pittsburgh. That's always like a thing he... Likes yeah. filming stuff in Pittsburgh. Um, and this is... A lot of people like to say this is like a direct sequel to Night of Living Dead and that zombies are now taking over the world. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a direct sequel. It is perhaps the official sequel. Yeah, well, it's part of the same series. Yeah. And yeah, it seems like it kind of takes off where that... It's like, oh, there's like a small cluster of zombies in the first film. And then this is like, you know, the world is becoming infected with zombies. I will say with it being released 10 years later, it does work in the sense that it does seem like this movie could take place 10 years after yeah, right? the last film. Yeah, and but this is to the point of where people are, you know, there's still the outbreak is new, and so people are guarding their family members who are mm-hmm. zombies and stuff, um, but teams are being sent in to exterminate them. Yeah, this movie focuses heavily on the military aspect of how the U.S. government would deal with the situation. Yeah, especially the beginning. It's all about, you know, the SWAT team going in and basically clearing out these zombies from families who are, are you know, can't let go of them because, you know, oh, it's my brother. It's not a zombie, even though he's, you know, they're attacking people and killing them and stuff. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the main plot is that, you know, zombies are taking over the world and you have this group of people. So you have Steven, the fly boy, mm-hmm. fly boy, um, Francine, um, Steven and Francine, they're basically, you know, work at this new station. He, I think Steven's yep. like a weather chopper guy or something. Um, but they're trying to get out of, yep. you know, trying to escape and find their own little haven away from everybody, trying to steal the chopper Yep. The, and then get out. And then you have Peter and Roger. Yep who are these SWAT team members who are sent in to exterminate all the zombies, you know, regardless of if the family members are there or not. And eventually they all meet, and then the kind four of, of them... together. Yeah, the yeah. four of them end up flying into this mall. Yep. And they basically hatch a scheme like, oh, well, you know, we can kind of barricade ourselves in this mall mm-hmm. and, you know, just hang out all the time. And we have unlimited supplies because yeah. it's a mall. Yeah, there's stores everywhere that it's an abandoned mall. They're yeah. like, oh, this is the perfect place to set up a, you know, fortress basically. Yeah. And that works pretty well for them. You know, they... For a while. Yeah, for a while. <laughs> and unfortunately, when they're trying to barricade the mall, one of them gets bitten. So it's like Roger and it's kind of on a, you know, like, well, what happens if you get bit, you know, like... 
sort of thing. Yeah. Like it's not really stated, but you know, it's like it's heavily implied. Like, oh, okay, you know, like I'm gonna off myself if I become a zombie or something. Yep. And um, so that's, that's basically the the big setup is them trying to get them all cleared out and kind of dealing with that crisis to so they could have their own little haven. Yeah. Um, and let me say a lot of zombie, a lot more zombies in this one. Yep. Uh, and they have the trademark blue face. Yeah. So this is what is considered the classic Romero zombie. Yeah. And one of the biggest reasons for the blue look to it is that they were. It's actually a mistake. Yeah. They're trying to mix in like gray and Tom Savini who was doing the makeup. Yep. Um, I think he, he didn't mix it correctly, and so they ended up with this kind of blue thing. He's like, oh, you know, I like that. And yep. for those of you who don't know Tom Savini, he did direct the Night of Living Dead 1990 film. Mm-hmm. Um, he's done tons and tons and tons of other films. I mean, just go look at his IMDb credits or something you know, if you yeah. want to see. Um, he was going to be on, he was going to be doing the makeup for Night of Living Dead. Yeah. But he had to enlist in the army. I think he got drafted. Mm-hmm. And so this, there was this whole thing of like oh you know he ended up making one of the most signature things of the blue zombie you know like this yeah. s- such a reference thing so many zombies un- you know until now where it's like everything's hyper realistic yeah um, i will say unfortunately there are like versions of this film that i've seen now where you know they've gone back and kind of recolor graded the film so uh, that the zombies look more green than they do blue uh, yeah that's, uh, that's unfortunate yeah. yeah and most of the older prints i've seen they're yeah pretty Pretty freaking blue, and George Romero even complained like, "Oh, yeah. it's so blue." <laughs> um, but yeah, I, th- I think that the the look of this film is pretty pretty great. <laughs> I I really like it. Yeah, it's you know, it was a weird time, and it has this sort of like f- these funny moments in it. It does. There's moments of intentional humor, but it is a serious film for the most part. Yeah, pretty dry. However, I will say. It kind of suffers in that it doesn't seem to achieve the same level of, I don't know, disparity as the last film had. Mm-hmm. Although it's supposed to be serious and you know, like there's a broadcast while they're in the mall that they receive, letting them know that civilization has completely crumbled and it's mm-hmm. gone now. Yeah. And so it's basically the end of the world as far as they know. Yet, uh, because they spend so little time really thinking about the outside world. Mm-hmm. There's, I don't know. There's more like of the characters getting along, whereas the last film was more about tension between characters. Yeah, It just doesn't have as much suspense to it, I feel. You know, I, I really agree with that. And I think that's because, yeah, they don't, they don't have as much to worry about once they get the zombies out. Yeah. And so there's basically a montage of them having fun, you know, playing in the arcade and yeah. stuff and, eating like all the sausage and all that stuff. It does feel like more of an 80s film. I know this is 1978, so we're moving into the 80s yeah. at this point. But it does kind of have that campy feel of a, like an 80s zombie film. Yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I think it definitely influenced a lot of films going yeah. into the 80s. And the 80s was the decade of yeah. comedy horror, yep. or at least like or, horror films with comedy bits. Yep. And our lighthearted moments, and I think that this definitely influenced that. Because if you look at what were, what were the biggest films before this, one of the biggest ones that you know everyone cites was um, The Exorcist, which I think was 1975. Mm-hmm. And horror kind of taking this the supernatural turn to it. And with Dawn of the Dead, going back to the sort of basic zombie thing yeah. and kind of switching the formula up a little bit, I think it really did set the formula for the 80s. Which is funny because yeah. even George Romero, when he did his eighties, you know, yeah. dead film, he didn't really he didn't really rip himself off. But yep. a lot of people had more successful films by ripping him off. But yeah, I think I think one of the biggest problems with this one is a lot of the characters in this film aren't are aren't as memorable. Or I mean they're they're all memorable in their own way. Yeah. But after seeing Night of Living Dead, they're you see comparisons and I don't you know, I still think that the female character Francine is still relatively a weak character yeah not like in that she's physically weak but in that she's you know just not written very well she's not a very dynamic character just one note like barbara barbara although barbara's like literally has like 10 lines in the whole yeah first movie. This barbara's is about as stack as a character can yeah be. but it, you know francine's just a, a little bit underwhelming yeah especially for playing a more leading role yeah and i think peter's 
my favorite <laughs> in this yeah. film, uh, Ken Foray. He's he's the best, and like the the two SWAT guys, like Roger and Peter, I think are the the best because they even though they really don't know each other that well, yeah, they like over the course of the movie you see them bond so much, and even when like stuff's going bad, like it's kind of like you know, like man, I I got you, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's great. Like he's also perhaps the uh, the most tortured character as he contemplate suicide at the end yeah, of the film there is in fact well we'll talk about the actually we can talk about it now um yeah because we'll go into spoilers on some of the the thing i'll warn you when it's gonna be spoilers yeah because it's like a there's basically a big second act that leads to the yeah end. and um which very much kind of changes the dynamic of the yeah. film but we'll talk about yeah. what uh, is the alternate cut yeah so there's um uh this this is gonna go into spoilers and stuff anyway so i'm just gonna say spoilers right here so one of the things that happens in the film is that these bikers come in and um and like take over the mall near the end and yeah. that's what ends up them having to take the helicopter and leave. Yeah. And that I've always found that a little bit strange right? because the most menacing figures in this film are the bikers and not the zombies which they're which is the center of the whole film. Yeah. So uh I like I don't understand why they would make the main villain. Well they always, thing I mean just like not living dead. The scariest people are the humans, right? But well, but I get it's, it's different though. In this it, one, it, yes. <laughs> I think it's stupid how they find him though. They yeah. find because they're trying to they they're trying to teach Francine how to fly the helicopter. Yeah. And so one of the bikers sees the helicopter, oh, and then falls all the way back to the wall yep. and somehow avoids the giant crowd of zombies. It's and, a little cheesy that a yeah. biker gang is fighting them yeah. in the mall. I agree. That's like <laughs> That I agree. That's I like the movie. I think it's so cool. And then it gets that part. I'm like, ah, it's, it's kind of stupid. But, but you know, uh, it does give us one of the most memorable zombies, which is the uh, Flyboy zombie. Yep. And it also gives us later the um, uh, what's it? The machete in the head. Yeah, the machete in the head zombie. Yeah. Because Tom Savini, he's the the guy who did the makeup and yep. and basically been involved with horror forever. You know, he has like his own makeup school and all that. Um, he is like the main biker and then even later in one of the dead movies he shows up as like an like you know a zombie version of the biker himself yeah so that that biker has become a famous kind of character from mm-hmm. the film which is funny because he's just kind of a jerk but yeah but getting in that alternate yeah cut. so <laughs> yeah so for the international release there was a scene where peter commits suicide yeah and so they decided to change it obviously because Dude, even though everybody pretty much died in the first one, I think they were like, well, let's give it a little bit of hope, yep. you know? And, you know, I, I think it works better that way. You know, he's like, there's a, a room full of zombies coming in to get him, and he's like, you know, like, going to shoot himself in the head. Yeah. And I was like, at the very last second, he's like, oh, okay, I'm going to kill you guys, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> and part of the reason that that cut exists in the first place is so Romero, uh, obviously, is behind these films, but on this film he's working with Dario Argento yes. who's another famous figure of Italian horror and uh, yeah we've talked about him Suspiria and, yeah and Phenomena and stuff but for this particular film he worked out a deal with Romero where he would get to handle the editing for the international version and so his edit is quite different from yeah uh, the so, one everyone has seen yeah so I think I've I think I kind of touched on this name we did briefly yeah, yeah. so um Inside of, I think, Italy and a few other places, it was released as Zombie, yeah. Z-O-M-B-I, mm-hmm. or some places I-E, you know, yeah. it just depends on where it is. Um, and it has a score by Goblin, of mm-hmm. course, Argento. <laughs> and Much faster cut. Yeah, um, much faster in, and in, in almost nauseatingly so sometimes. It, it is a little bit much. Um, I will say it's kind of ahead of its time in that not... You know, very many films at that time were doing that fast of cuts. Like it's more of like a modern, you know, paced film. Mm. Unfortunately, with what they were working with and the plot, I don't think it lends itself to the film very well. I don't think so either. In fact, I, you know, I I waited a while to see that cut because I couldn't find it anywhere. The yeah. DVD is really expensive and stuff. And when I saw, it, I was kind of disappointed. I yeah. mean, because he's Dario Argento is known for horror, and you know, he's you know. Yeah. He's not known for making movies that make the most sense, but they're often beautiful, very well edited, very yep. well color graded. Mm-hmm. They're the works of art. Yeah, and I uh, was hoping for a similar experience with this, but I gotta say, 
you know, I like George Romero's version of it a lot better. And I like his version, but I kind of like Argento's ending more with the suicide included. I don't even know if they even included that in some versions of some versions have the original uh, lived yeah. version, but like so even that you know alternate version has an alternate version of it. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I just I think that the while the George Romero one is maybe a little bit slower paced, it definitely suits the film better. I think it does too. The, the the beginning I feel goes by a lot slower, but it's you get to know the characters a lot better. Like I feel like I feel like a lot of the scenes that are kind of make you like sympathize with the characters mm-hmm. are just cut a little too short. Yeah, to kind of impacted enough to where i'm like ah you know like i like the, well, the argento cut. film feels like it goes by in 30 minutes even though it's not that much shorter than the yeah, romero cut which is weird because it feels a little bit more boring yeah <laughs> that's weird <laughs> that's strange but uh yeah i don't know and but this is even weirder because the argento version zombie spawned its own series of films yeah <laughs> called uh, zombie two three and four yep so if you're trying to buy the and I swear I think I've touched on this in an, on an episode. So zombie two, if you're confused in America why we have zombie we have zombie one, zombie three and four, or zombie flesh eaters. Yeah. Um. Uh. The reason is if you've been missing zombie, it's Dawn of the Dead. Yep. And what they did is when zombie two came over here. Yep. Which is the sequel to that version of the film. Yep. They renamed it zombie. Yeah. Is the O M B I, and then when two, three were, I mean three and four were coming out, they were like, "Well, I'll just call it three and four. So we have zombie one, three and four. Yeah. It's really zombie <laughs> two, three and four. Yeah, <laughs> it's so so weird. Um, but yeah, that spawned its own series. Yep. And just like if we ever talk about Return of the Living Dead, that becomes its own thing too. And yeah. As a sequel to Night of the Living Dead and yada yada, but that's a whole thing. Um, yep. If you're wondering what my opinion is on Dawn of Dead as compared to Night of the Living Dead, you know, I think I, I think I like Night of the Living Dead a little bit more. I definitely have to agree with you. And I'd say that I wish I could say that I like this film more because, you know, it is such a classic. Mm-hmm. I know that so many people love it and you know, the zombies from it are just have this great look to them. Mm-hmm. The whole movie has yeah. this weird you know, just the colors yellow and blue. Yeah. Like But I will say Night of the Living Dead just feels like it's better written. The com- the characters are more compelling. Ben is such a memorable character. He is. I find it more scary. I find well, it more, more disturbing. With the yeah. characters. It, it, it's more, you know, heartbreaking to watch everyone die, and, mm-hmm. you know, versus this film, you know, characters die, but I, I don't feel heartbroken yeah. if, they, you know, I, if they die. I really agree with that. Um, only really one character was I like, please don't die, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I, and it's weird because, you know, the first one that I saw was Dawn of the Dead, 1978 yeah. one. And so you think I would have like some like rush nostalgia being like, this is the best one. But yeah, I got to say, you know, I like Night of the Living Dead more. Yeah. And um, and for me, it's it's rare that I would pick, I don't know, I, I think, uh, you know, the very earliest incarnation of, you know, a, a film series like this. Um, but you know, Night of the Living Dead really just holds up very well. It does. It, you know, it's surprising. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is surprising because while there are good films from, you know, the 60s, 50s, you know, mm-hmm. early cinema, you know, not all of them hold up in the same way that, you know, modern films do. And while Night of the Living Dead isn't exactly a modern film by any means, mm-hmm. it, it really does feel like it holds up to the standards of modern writing, at least. It does. Yeah. I, I really agree with that because the dialogue is so, so good. Yeah. Well, like I said, with the exception of Barbara. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, if you're wondering what I think of the remake, it's not nearly as good as the original. Yeah. Uh, if you want like a little bit more generic version of this with, a demon, a zombie baby being born, and if you basically want the Evil Dead remake, but for this, yeah, it, <laughs> it just adds in some things I think that are not necessary. Yeah. Um, so that's my review of the 2004 one. If we ever cover, we might cover it in depth one day, but I don't like it nearly, nearly as much as the original. I would um, definitely agree with that. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's Dawn of the Dead. Okay, now we're on to. Day of the Dead. Yep. And not Dio de los Muertos. Nope. The third movie in this. Yeah. <laughs> series of films. Series, yeah. <laughs> not trilogy. Series. 
Um, yes, 1985. And this is a different beast altogether. Yeah, it takes a very different approach from either of the last two films. And you could say that each film takes its own approach, you know, to some extent. Mm-hmm. I would say that each film has a distinct tone that's very different from all the others. Yeah. This one, I would say, is much more serious than the last film. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It, it's on par with being as serious as Night of the Living Dead, but definitely has a different tone than Night of the Living Dead. Absolutely. This, So, um, basically, Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead were successes yeah. in the box office, especially for the budget. Mm-hmm. This got a very mixed critical reaction. Yeah. And um, while it did make money, it wasn't as seen as successful or as good as the previous ones. Mm-hmm. But nowadays, it's, it's definitely kind of, you know, history has kind of uh, put some some life into this and yeah. basically in retrospect it's been received a lot better well the whole living dead series has kind of become a cult series in and of itself yeah partially due to night of the living dead and then dawn of the dead success mm-hmm. and then just nostalgia and people coming back and looking at these films has really brought light to other films in the series that you know might not have gotten as much attention yeah um this is i'm, I'm gonna say right that i think this is my favorite of the dead films of these three that we're talking about today yeah and i just for some reason, you know, I it put off watching this for a long time because I, I'd heard from everybody like, oh, this one's boring. This one has so much more talking than the ones. And I will say, at least for me, yeah. I feel like I have to be in the right mood to watch Day of the Dead. I do love this film. I like it a lot more than I do Dawn of the Dead. And not to say that I don't like Dawn of the Dead, but I just feel this this is a better movie. Yeah. So basically, the plot of this film, and it, I think this has been said, this is a direct sequel to you know, Dawn of the Dead, and that zombies have taken over the planet. Yeah, the civilization it, is destroyed. It feels much more like a direct sequel than, you know, whereas Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead feels like there's a bit of space between them. Mm-hmm. So you, basically there's this group of people who are living in this bunker. Yeah. And um, they go and like scour the cities trying to find if anybody's alive or anything. They see be radio people. Mm-hmm. And they there's two groups of people in here. There's like the scientists... And there's the military. The yeah. military was supposed to make sure that the scientists could figure out how to solve the zombie problem. Yeah. But and, as the story progresses, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a bit of tension that builds between the scientists and the military. Yeah. Basically, right at the beginning of the film, they say that, oh, Major Cooper has died. Yeah. And so as a result of that, you have Captain Henry Rhodes, or Rhodes, yeah. as they call him in the film, who's, who's taken over the military yep. portion of this operation. And he is... He's an asshole. 80s jerk. He's <laughs> the quintessential 80s guy who you're like, how the heck are you going to die? Yep. Like, I mean, you could just feel it coming on. But the main character is Sarah in yeah. this film. And she's probably the strongest, you know, female lead that Romero's written thus far. Yeah. And I love her. I she's think great in this film. She's awesome. She's like, all the other dudes are like breaking, like Miguel and stuff. Like one of the soldiers is like breaking down and yeah, and like Rhodes. God, being, Miguel's so annoying. This I one. know he's really annoying. <laughs> but uh, Sarah's like the tough, you know, like almost like aliens or something, you know, where she's just like yeah, kicking butt and uh, taking names, even though she's a scientist though. Yep. <laughs> but um, there's this whole thing about them trying to get specimens, so they try to wrangle up zombies from this mine that's yeah. attached to where they're staying and. The doctor operates on them, uh, and they call him Doctor Frankenstein. But his Matthew Logan is his name. Yeah. But they call him Frankenstein. Yeah, because he's you know, kind of a weird character, eccentric. And, yep, eighties doctor who's operating on zombies. He's the mad scientist. Yeah, because you know, while Sarah is looking for a way to reverse you know the zombification process frankenstein as they call him is looking for a way to control them so that they can perhaps use the zombies mm, exactly and it's not working that well and by the you know throughout the movie he shows like there's one zombie called bub yep and the most like i said memorable zombie from the yep. movie isn't that crazy to think that a zombie could be memorable in a movie um but yeah, this is zombie Bub who's trying to basically train and see if he can remember yeah. what it was like to be human. So he gives him like a razor yeah, and he sees that he can remember shaving. Yeah. He, he he shows signs of being able to remember aspects of humanity. He was in the, he can tell that he was in the military and he yep. gives him like a, a handgun and sees if he can use it and he 
like remembers how to load and like shoot a gun. Dismember the gun. And, yeah, yeah uh, it's and Bub is a great, great character, and I love him. He's so lovable. Yeah, even though he would rip my head open and eat my brains. He, but isn't he that really any is. relationship? Isn't that all you can really <laughs> help for? <laughs> I, I definitely have to agree with you. Uh, you know, watching Bub and, you know, seeing Frankenstein work with them, uh, you, you really kind of develop a certain level of sympathy for Bub. Yeah. You know, especially with Rhodes being such, you know, a douche all the time. I know. And, you know, he's going to shoot Bubs at one point and, you know, you know Frankenstein's like, no, don't. No, like, you must wa- not do this. Like, watch, watch what he can do. <laughs> I know. know. It's it's crazy. Yeah. But the, the whole breakdown in communication like everyone it's hard to describe the tone of this film it is very unique and it is kind of i don't know you you can almost view it as you know an analysis of what would happen you know again kind of like night of the living dead where except in this situation it's the military and you know the scientists who are working together and there is a breakdown in communications. Obviously people are fighting because they're scared. They don't know mm-hmm. how long they're going to live. And you know, if the, they should even be spending resources on trying to find a solution, yeah, the, the military would rather just kill the zombies and the scientists think that that's wasteful. And you know, that's just going to lead to us dying eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, but the military doesn't see any progress from the science, so they don't see the point in funding it anymore. Yep. Well, the whole thing is, and they and they bring it up because when they started the, um, when they started this whole thing, yeah, it was they like oh, it was basically thrown together. You know, they don't have the proper research equipment. They don't. Yeah, they they, they mentioned don't even have that, that the much m- weapon. Mission was put together in a few days or something. Yeah, exactly, and. It's it's this whole thing of like, you know, the the people are threatening him, like the the military threatening him, like you know, oh well, if you don't show us some progress, then we're just gonna get out of here. And the yeah. and Frankenstein, the doctor, is like, well, where are you gonna go? He's like, yep, there is nowhere to go. You know, like and that, it's like, that is one of the most compelling dialogues I will say in the movie. Yeah, is when you know R- Rhodes basically threatening to kill uh, Sarah and if she won't sit down for the meeting, which she views as pointless mm-hmm. and Frankenstein walks in late and, you know, it's like, Oh, where's the food at? And oh, yeah. <laughs> everybody's like, you don't, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he, the military is just like, you know, we're, we're, we're through with this, you know, there's no point in funding this. You guys have been wasting our times. We're just going to leave you guys here and, you know, kill the zombies. And Frankenstein's just like, how, yeah. Where are you gonna go? Yeah, he's like, he's like, if you could have shot him all in the head, you would have done that by now. Yep. He's like, it's pointless now. It's too many. Yep. It's, yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. It, and this movie has an extremely claustrophobic feeling to it. Yeah. And that, like, you know, you could just tell it. There's nowhere to go. Like, if they were to, if one of side were to go against the other side, they would be right next to each other. Yeah. And uh, it's really interesting. And I, while yes, I would say with this movie over the other ones, there are tropes everywhere yeah and tropes in case you don't know it's like stereotypical types of characters mm-hmm. we have the yeehaw military america characters yep. you know we have the the jerk military dude who's like well i would shoot them all you know yeah. and we have the crazy eccentric scientist we have the uh the, the two pilots are kind of offensive yeah stereotypes of like an irish a drunk irishman we have the very altruistic scientist lead yeah it's just, um, yeah, so you have a lot of, you have m- more characters, but I think, you know, it works in that they all play off each other for different reasons. I will say, I hate Miguel in this movie. All he does is complain. Yeah, Miguel is kind of hard to take in this film. Yeah. Like, and his death, his death sucks. <laughs> like, hey, I'll say the spoiler. So here's where we're getting the spoilers of, of Day of Dead, just in case you want to watch it. There's a part where Miguel gets bitten. Yep. And then they cut off his arm and, like, they try and stop the cauterize infection. it. It's yep. like, it looks all, he's like, rah, screaming. And they end up killing him anyway. Yep. It's like so, so sad. It's just like, God, oh, it's so brutal for him to go through that. Well, but he, he messes everything up. Like, he becomes suicidal and starts letting zombies in. Yep. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's, yep. It's just, I don't know. Some of the characters are a little bit annoying in this. And oh, also Greg Nicotero, who does makeup for like Evil Dead and yeah. stuff. Evil Dead 2 uh, is in this film, plays one of the soldiers. 
But I will say that when Rhodes finally gets it, he's got the best death ever. Yep. He's ripped in half by the zombies, and they're pulling out his organs, and he goes, choke on him, choke on him. Like, yep. one of the best deaths in a zombie <laughs> movie ever. I just my favorite, because I love seeing him get it. Mm-hmm. Oh. oh, it's a great scene. I, I have to say another one of my favorite scenes is uh, with... Uh, Dr. Logan dying and uh, Bub's actually showing sadness over, mm-hmm. you know, Dr. Logan's death. I thought that was such, you know, a great display of emotion and it just show that, you know, perhaps, you know, how real something like this could be, you know, it, you know, obviously this is science fiction, you know, we don't have zombies walking mm-hmm. around, yeah. but, uh, well, I mean, I don't know, you well, know, you can say cell phones and people go, but you know, I get, yeah. <laughs> But it really shows, you know, how hard it would be to deal with this, you know, to think about the fact that these, you know, creatures were human and perhaps still are human because you in have, some way, yeah. yeah, you have bubs who, who can remember things about being human. And, you know, even after everyone thinks that they have no remorse at all for any of their mm-hmm. actions, he feels sadness again. Yeah. It, Bub, I gotta say, um, the guy who I forget what the guy's name is who um, played Bub, but that is such a good acting job. Yeah, you know, essentially a guy who can only go, mama, you know, like, yeah. or <laughs> and is in full makeup, and he completely expresses all this emotion with his hands, with his body language, and mm-hmm. his eyes, and is great. I think best character in the film. Like I think I would definitely agree. And Sarah is the best written female that George Romero has ever done. Yep, <laughs> like. But yeah, I I really really enjoy Day of the Dead. Super depressing, like yeah, uh, in its in its own way. I mean, all the all his films are kind of meant to be depressing in the end. But like this, this is just has a very super dark tone. There is a lot of talking, I'll yeah. say a lot of a lot of meetings, yeah, and stuff like that. It um, does have perhaps maybe a happier ending than the other two films. Bit, yeah, a little bit. I would say it's a little bit happier ending. But yeah, the um. The rest of the film, though, is much more dark than the other. Yeah, and I wouldn't be. I'm not surprised that it has people either have a love or hate it thing for it. Some people are like yeah. it really is awful, and some people are like this is the best one. I will say, you know, at least in my opinion, it it does feel a little slow for me at times. I do think it's a great film. You know, it's great makeup, by the way. I think oh, this is one of some of the best special effects. Like, amazing makeup. Oh. But I, I do have to be in the mood for this movie. I do have to be willing to sit down and put in the time for it. Yeah. Whereas for me, I can kind of, you know, it's probably different for most people. I don't think most people can just throw on Night of the Living Dead, but I can. I can just throw it on and watch it. Mm-hmm. And I always, you know, can always watch that. But you know, this movie requires a certain level of focus for me. Definitely. But I definitely think it's worth it because it's a really good film. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think if you are in the... Move for a zombie film that's a little bit different, not just you know some teenagers running from them or you know like a SWAT team going in, you know, though, yeah. like they all are nowadays. Um, I think that this is, you know, a film that explores a few different things that zombie movies don't explore at all anymore. Yep. So, um, yeah, that's what I'd say about David. I think it might be my favorite. I yeah, know. I mine is Night of the Living Dead, and this is definitely my second. Dawn of the Dead, unfortunately, is my third favorite. We can go visit that mall, by the way. I'm pretty sure the mall in Dave, uh, Dawn of the Dead is like still open. Yeah. Yeah. Def- I'm, I'm pretty sure. We should do that one day. Yeah. I know it was like getting ready to close. Maybe close now, but I know that at one point it was still open. <laughs> and it still had like kind of the same look a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, uh, that's that's our episode of Gothcast, episode 40. Yep. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I can almost guarantee you we're going to do more George Romero episodes and, yeah. and the dead series. The dead series continues on. Um, yeah. So we'll definitely so. be doing more Romero and more Argento as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can be expecting that at some point. And so this episode has been brought to you in part by the Belfry. Uh, yeah. The Belfry is a podcast network where you can find, Pretty much anything you're looking for, whether you're a veteran of the Gothic community or someone who's new and 
kind of trying to get into things. They have, of course, links to blogs and YouTube channels, but it's primarily a podcast network. And so you can find our podcast on there as well as uh, Cemetery Confessions and The Requiem and Horror Addicts and various other podcasts. But it's a really good resource for people in the gothic community. Yeah. And of course, if you want to find anything related to us, you can search on Facebook, Tumblr, and Instagram. All just Gothcast. Gothcast, G-O-T-H-C-A-S-T. Um, if you want to find our Twitter, that's underscore Gothcast underscore. If you want to find everything under the sun relating to Gothcast, it's all aggregated on our website, which is gothcastradio.com. That's G-O-T-H-C-A-S-T-R-A-D-I-O.com. No www, because why would we do that? It's too many Ws. Yep. Um, and, uh, of course, if you want to get a hold of us by email, you can contact us at gothcastradio at gmail.com. Yeah, and we're always happy to respond to comments, requests. Anything. Yeah, pretty much if you would just want to say hello, you know, we'll pretty much respond to it or at least try to. Exactly. And, um, of course, remember on this day of days for Halloween to be safe and to stay spooky. Yep. <laughs>